Hello and welcome. Another edition of our Thursday Coaches Corner, uh, where each and every Thursday take some time to spend with college coaches across the country, all levels, all divisions. Coach Serrano is wrapping up his fall baseball at Johnson University, so I'm flying solo here today. Joined, uh, this is really going to work well and coincide with my recent uh, conversations pertaining to the postgraduate and the academic side of college athletics. Today I'm joined um, by head coach, University of Pennsylvania, the Quakers, uh, John Yerkow. And John, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I really appreciate you squeezing in a few minutes to join me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be here and looking forward to it. You know, John, I, I think our first question that I, I, I am curious about is, you know, all of these changes that are being discussed and a lot of parents and athletes are following uh, you know, not only the transfer portal, but more importantly, the settlement, um, you know, potential roster caps and things of that nature. You know, with all of this, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, roster management, how has this affect, affected the culture at UPenn or the Ivy League in, in general with regard to your recruiting, uh, you know, strategies, uh, you know, moving forward uh, from 2025 and beyond? Yeah, I think, you know, particularly here at Penn, I don't think it's going to affect us nearly as much as it's going to affect, um, you know, a lot of the bigger schools. Um, you know, if you look at what's kind of transpired over the last few years, um, you know, I, when you look at like a fall roster, you know, we, we've been at a, at a 40 man roster the, the past few years due to COVID. Right. And that was done on a year to year waiver process. It used to be 35. So there was an extension and you were able to keep more players. Um, but people, what they don't realize at those bigger schools, when the fall starts, typically there's way more than 40 guys that are on that fall roster. Um, you know, we've sent a ton of kids to post-grad that had a year left due to COVID reasons over the last two or three years at a bunch of power five schools or power four schools. Um, and it's not uncommon for some of those teams to start a fall season in the mid fifties, as far as guys on their roster and then have to trim that down to 40. Um, so you're talking about a lot of kids that are going to have to find new homes, you know, midway through the year, you know, in the Ivy league and, and, and um, again, here at Penn, like we're, we're currently sitting at 35 guys on our roster. You know, I, I've had a roster a little higher than that, maybe up to 37 at times, but we're generally in the 35, 36 roster range. Um, so I don't really think that's going to affect us, um, that much at all. You know, I've being in the new England area, I follow Ivy league, Patriot league, uh, athletics, uh, really closely. Uh, I'm a big fan, but I would love for you to kind of share a lot of parents throughout the country. When I start to talk about Ivy league, particularly with regard to athletics, they don't realize how strong these programs are across all sports, but particularly baseball. And I know you've, you're now going on your 11th year at Penn, but I've watched some of your games, for instance, last year against Harvard. Uh, I mean, it's a really great quality baseball and the physicality and the, the skill at the Ivy league has really, um, you know, I think, grown over the last few years, but I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about the caliber of play, the skill and the talent, uh, that the resources that you have access to at Penn and, and how the Ivy league is growing as, as a, a league within baseball. Yeah, I think, um, one of the things that's really led to the, the level of play improving, I, there's some really good coaches in this league, um, you know, and they, they, they do a really good job. I think they, there's a focus on player development. Uh, the fact that we, we can't really take, we can't take grad transfers. We're not, you don't see a lot of Ivy te teams taking many kids from the portal. So the players that we do decide to, to, to bring into school, we have to really make sure we're bringing kids in, even if they're not there, their freshman year are going to be guys a year, two years down the line are going to be able to contribute to our programs. So there has to be a heavy emphasis on kids that are going to be coachable kids um and you know that i feel like the teams in our league that have really good assistant coaches and coaching staffs have really thrived but just by spending a lot more time with their guys and putting an emphasis on the player development side and i, I at the facilities in our in our league um 
I think are really good. Um, you know, over the past couple seasons, I mean, you know, obviously we're playing in the Northeast. I think six out of the, the eight teams have turf. The indoor facilities have really improved over the past few years. I can tell you here at Penn, we have like a full um, air structure that's heated. It goes up at the end of November. So if we need to go inside, we can actually scrimmage in there. It's bigger than a football field. And I know there's a few other schools in our league that have a similar setup, uh, which is really important in the Northeast, you know. And then on the weight room side, you know, now more than ever, there's such a, a heavy emphasis on strength and conditioning, speed and agility. And I, I think it's just kind of trickled down, you know, to our level. And you're seeing some really talented kids coming out of our league. You know, Ivy League has always been uh, very patient with the recruiting process, which I've always said to parents is the best way to approach recruiting, regardless of sport, but particularly baseball, because it allows body and kind of academic sides to mature. But now in light of the fact that, you know, you have the August 1st deadline, what is it, you know, particularly at Penn, when are you identifying your student athletes and when is your recruiting process starting with regard to the high school athlete? Yeah, we might differ a little bit compared to some of our um, some of the other teams in our league. I think we're probably maybe a little bit more aggressive. Um, like, for instance, right now, I think, you know, we've got a few 26s committed already. And there were some guys that we started to identify, I'd say, you know, in, in this summer um, and then just try to follow them. I do see a trend, though. I think what's going to start happening, I think you're going to see like that really high level can't miss prospects still committing early, not just in the Ivy League, but across the country. But I think it's going to start to slow down a little bit if this roster crunch comes along and it is at 34 players. Um, I think in, in years past, you know, it, it was easy just to like cast a wide net, projectable kid. He had some velocity, you know, going into his junior year. Hey, you want to come to school X? We just take as many as you can. And then we'll just figure it out when those guys get here, even if we're, we're a little high on our roster numbers. Teams aren't going to be able to do that anymore. So they're going to have to be a lot more selective, which I think in turn could lead to this starting to slow down. Um, and maybe guys won't be so apt to take people, you know, as soon as, as September 1 hits when they can get them on a campus. You know, I've been doing a lot of discussion uh, for years now, but more importantly in today's uh, world of baseball recruiting, working with families to get them to understand the potential and the value of a postgraduate year. In my opinion, a, a true postgraduate year that entails the academic piece, Phillips Andover, Exeter, Winchington, uh, Deerfield, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about the role that that may play for Penn moving forward? Maybe it hasn't been uh, a big uh, part of the recruiting component now, but would that, in light of these roster changes coming and some of the the slowdowns with regard to the 25 through 26, 27 class, will the role of the postgraduate uh, athletes begin to get a little bit bigger, uh, not only in the Ivy League, but college baseball as a whole? Yeah, I, I absolutely think it's going to be an option for more kids moving forward. And we've, we've had success taking postgrad grad kids for for different reasons um some that that just wanted another year to develop we've had a few kids where they were injured and, and missed their junior and senior recruiting window um, i think it is a good option for certain kids guys mature at all different ages um, and maybe for that younger kid in his class that's a little underdeveloped an extra year of school can be extremely beneficial i think the other thing too that can be at least in our league if a kid is kind of a borderline student, if he's going to decide to go take another year on the academic side, it could also help that applicant as far as maybe a guy that's on the fence of being admitted and put another solid year, you know, taking good classes. Now that could really enhance the student's profile and admissions will, will look a lot more favorably on that, on that young man. Uh, I think the other part of it too, with, with just less roster spots available, um in college baseball there may be some kids that in years past would have never thought about going to a post-grad that say hey my options are limited i don't want to settle on a particular you know on a school maybe if i go and develop i go back into the recruiting cycle the following year and you're a different player that that student athlete could have some more options potentially so a couple of the kind of ancillary questions to that is one hypothetical situation young man 
off the radar, goes to a post-grad school, baseball being a spring sport, obviously. Uh, is there a hard, firm deadline, A, for the Ivy Leagues? In other words, if you're not in by fall regular application process, there's no room at the end. And then B, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot about supported applications and, and the number of supported applications. What is the typical recruiting class size of not only a pen, but what you feel like from an Ivy League perspective, is it six to eight student athletes per class? Just to give parents some kind of understanding as to the potential, if they're going to consider a post-grad year. Yeah, I well, I could tell you for us, um, you know, we had a junior that we lost as a free agent that signed after the draft. We had, we currently have 34, 35 guys on our roster right now. So if he wouldn't have signed, we would have had 36. So that's going to average out to like nine nine guys a year for us. Every Ivy League school is going to be a little bit different. And those decisions on how many spots you get, that that's all dictated by your specific school. So it's going to be a little bit different across the board. So we're going to be eight to nine guys typically every year that we can support in the admissions process. You know, do you have the ability, you know, if it's late in the spring and somebody, you know, suddenly they, their skill set just develops off the, off the charts and they're, they're in the Northeast or the mid Atlantic and they're doing a PG year. Is there room in that graduating class to get them in through uh, as far as admissions, or is that a hard cutoff date of, you know, somewhere in January. It, it's difficult. Um, you know, obviously we have an early decision deadline, November 1st, and then we have a regular decision. There's a little bit of leeway, but you start getting in the middle of the spring. It's going to be really difficult to get a high school student athlete in. And then there's a rule for transfers. Um, it's an Ivy League rule that you have to be accepted, admitted into a school by June 15th. So you can see for Ivy League schools, when that transfer window opens up, the portal window, it, there's not a lot of time if you're going to make it happen. So it's a, it's a, it's a crunch. All right. So now I want to get to the fun stuff. You know, I, as I alluded to earlier, I will go down and see deck whenever somebody's coming in that I interest, I'm interested in watching in Cambridge. Talk about the caliber of play at the Ivy league level. You know, a lot of parents think like this is some form of extension of of high school play couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, Ivy league baseball as evidenced by the back to back, uh, Ivy league championships, your appearances in the, uh, the regionals. I mean, you you took St. John's, uh, I think that was a one run loss. If I remember correctly, UVA was four to two. I mean, you're playing some great baseball and the caliber of athletes at Penn are comparable to anywhere in the country, but just talk about the caliber of play weekend and week out as far as within the Ivy league, you know, the Columbia's and the Browns and the Harvard's and the Yale's it's a competitive league. Yeah. Um, I think it, you know, three or four years ago, I think it might've been 21. We opened up down at A and M, um, you know, and we went down there our first series. We had a really good team that year and um, we wind up winning the series down at A&M to open the season. I think right. people are like, how did this happen? And uh, obviously we had a good club and I think Schloss had just gotten to A&M. It was his it first just year. Got there, right. Yeah. And he was, you know, and they were trying to figure stuff out, but that was like a good, you know, benchmark, obviously a huge series win for us. Um, you know, and then we you'll see across the league that I think there are teams that are willing to challenge themselves and play really tough competition early in the season. And for us, that typically means getting on an airplane and flying to, you know, at down South, whether it's in Texas or Florida or North Carolina, where it's going to be extremely challenging. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's kind of helped our league teams, not shying away from that and kind of leaning into it. I, I think like what I, the biggest difference when I look at like rosters and how they're, they're made up. If you look at like an Ivy league team and obviously the past couple of years, like, you know, we go down to the Auburn regional and we, we, we not, we beat Auburn and Sanford and we're one game away from going to a super regional. And unfortunately we couldn't beat Southern Miss, but you know, maybe the depth on the mound is probably the biggest difference when, when you kind of compare it. But if you look, look at the top six or seven arms at most of the Ivy league programs, there, you know, there, there's schools that are turning out a lot of, a lot of pro guys, um, you know, and I don't think that's a coincidence. So the, the top level of play that those arms it's been really good, and I, I expect it to continue to get even better. I think not just for Division One baseball, I think this number crunch that we're going to run into, if teams really have to declare 34 
starting next fall by the first day of class, there is going to be a trickle down effect that's going to affect it. it it's going to hit the mid majors. It, that it's going to be better for mid majors because some of those guys where maybe at an SEC school is like, hey, we're just going to give you a roster spot. We'll see how you do in the fall. That's not going to happen anymore. So that applicant pool is going to grow, and then it's going to Division Two baseball is going to get better. Division Three baseball is going to get better. I think junior college baseball is going to see a jump in talent too around the country. So it's going to be really interesting to see how all that all plays out. Um, I do think, uh, Walter, that when COVID hit, the way we handled COVID, it kind of we kind of took a step back from a developmental spot because we really lost like two, two years. Two years. Um, right. And I think we're starting to get back to a point now where, you know, I think the league is, is really starting to improve. What, what I would love for you to share, I see Mike, I, you know, I see Mike everywhere whenever I'm out some, you know, I try to tell parents, you know, Ivy leagues are out, same events, uh, you know, across the country. I see Mike more so some, at some points, I see you out, Scotty Bradley, those guys out at like show ball events, types like that. But when you're recruiting, when you're actively recruiting during the summer months, are you more of a proponent of going into, you know, the, the tournaments in Georgia, Florida, or are you more inclined to focus on your camps when it comes to that active pursuit of a recruit? Would you rather get them on campus so that they get to see the lay of the land? Or do you like to go out and watch them? you know, competing in, in, in those bigger events during the summer. I, I think the perfect scenario is going to see recruits at tournaments um, at least once or twice. And then if you can, if you can manage scheduling wise to get them on the campus for one, for a camp, that's even better. That's like the perfect scenario. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, I, I think the other thing about that too, at least, the way we really we do things and, and things that I value, I really like spending a lot of time with parents. And I know at some of the bigger schools now, they feel like they don't have the time to do that because it's so competitive. But you know, if, if you're only going to bring in eight or nine guys, and you have to be efficient with those spots as far as getting guys into school, you you got to make sure you're getting the right ones. And not not only is it an athlete on the field, but guys that I think are going to fit really well with what we do as far as our team culture here with the current players on the team, with the coaching staff. So, it, you know, there are times where you see a guy and like, oh, we have to have him. But I also think that sometimes you can, you know, coaches make mistakes and we all make mistakes. It's, as you know, it's not a perfect science, right? Um, but I feel like the more time you can spend with a recruit, whether it be on a Zoom call with mom and dad, watching them play, how they interact with their teammates, I think, you're, you're giving yourself a chance to be more efficient and make fewer mistakes when it comes to um, evaluation. So talk about that a little bit, because sometimes when I'm working with parents, I try to get them to understand they're part of the process, but you know, you, they're, you, your son is being recruited, but the parents play a pivotal role with regard to recruiting on, on a myriad of different levels. You know, how does the athlete interact with their parents? How did the parents, are they fully engaged in all hands on deck or are they allowing their son to kind of take the, take the lead in the process? Talk a little bit about that with your interactions during the camps or the college visits, the role that the family plays with regard to the recruiting process. Yeah, I think like the perfect setup is when parents are supportive, um, they're engaged in the recruiting somewhat, but not too much. And and they are ultimately going to let their son make the decision of where they're going to go. But I always, I do still feel like, you know, there's a financial piece to this too. And, and that's part of the family decision. So I think it is extremely important to have them involved in that. Um, you know, and I just feel like if you can get to know mom and dad really well and see what they're like, and they're good people, typically their son's going to be a good kid. Right. And I think we've all been there as coaches. I'm sure you could, every coach could tell you a story about how they were recruiting a kid at some point and all you go to a game and you watch how the parents, maybe how they acted a game or something that happened on a recruiting visit. And you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know about this one. I don't know if this is going to be worth it. Um, yeah, so, true. you know, so that's, that's definitely something that, that plays into it. And, 
you know, just asking a lot of open-ended questions, seeing what's important to the families, and then by their answers, seeing if that's going to align, you know, what we do here on a daily basis. You know, and you bring up a point there, and I, a lot of parents are, are going to wish I had asked this question, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it. And that is the financial piece. You know, the Ivy League has always been in that we don't do scholarships mentality. In today's world, you know, it used to just be how much of a scholarship am I going to get? Now it's name, image, and likeness. How much money do I have? Can I, you know, earn any money, et cetera? Is there aid or merit money that's available for athletes within the Ivy League, particularly at Penn, obviously, and the role of the name, image, and likeness? I mean, is that something the Ivy Leagues will ever dip their toe into, or is that just going to stay on the outside? Yeah, I, well, uh, uh, two parts, right? We'll, we'll talk about what Penn does internally as, as, far, as, um, as far as aid, and it's, it's all need-based aid. And what's interesting, I think – there are a lot of parents out there that when you when you talk about financial aid, they hear financial aid and they think of maybe going to like a state school and they have this preconceived, these preconceived thoughts in their head, like, oh, we're never gonna we're never gonna qualify for financial aid. We, we did it at this school and you know, I, I know we're not gonna get anything. One of the advantages, you know, with, with these Ivy League schools and where the endowments are set up, it's way different the financial aid process at an Ivy league school. Um, they're probably similar to like, even like the NESCAC schools, like the right. those types yep. of schools, right. It's going to be way different than it would be at, at maybe like a state school. They, the formulas they use to come up with the, the expected family contribution. Um, it's way more generous. So we always try to tell people, Hey, go, go look at the financial aid calculator, which you can do in 10, 15 minutes to get an idea, a snapshot, of what school would cost on that on that side so that's part one on the, the second part of your question was based towards nil um and it, it is something ivy ivy league has adopted an official policy on it you can do it here as an ivy as a as an ivy athlete we've had kids do it in other sports i don't i don't think it's ever going to become as big as you know some of these these bigger conferences you know, like that we talk about and baseball you know in the SEC, the ACC, or the Big Ten, but it, it's going to be there. It's it's not going away. So my final question, because a lot of the terminology that IVs and NESCAT, Patriot League, the academics, that parents don't have a, a deep understanding of, terms like pre-reads, uh, and that's really applicable to the academic, to the transcript. And then the other question is, are test scores a part of the pen application process? My feeling is always trying to get athletes to understand that the test scores are always going to be favorable more than they would be uh, a negative, you know, so take test scores. But the first part of this question is, can you explain the pre-read, meaning if a student athlete is someone that you can bring to admissions? And then the other part of that is, where do test scores fit? uh with regard to admissions at penn yeah well the first thing we're going to do when we're inquiring about a kid is we're going to is we're going to ask what the grades look like and it, that how quickly we can get our eyes on a transcript um let's say we're looking at a junior um you know early in the junior year or maybe the summer going into the junior year you know in august you know you, you get your eyes on a transcript and i've been here for 18 years now total right so I have a pretty good indication of what's going to work here and what's not. Um, you know, a couple of things I'm looking for outside of having a good GPA, we want to make sure that there's enough rigor in the in the transcript. Hopefully it's great if a kid's got to make maybe one or two APs his junior year because that sets him up to have a few more maybe his senior year. So those things are going to be uh, critical when we're looking at a guy initially. Um, as far as testing, we always required testing up until COVID. At that point, we went to a test optional school. We've been a test optional school um, for the past, since COVID started. We haven't announced for 26 what our policy is gonna be. I know, I think half of the schools in the league for 2026 grads are test optional. Um, I, think to go and, I think the test optional thing is great for everybody. You know, we've all had those kids that we've recruited that have been unbelievable, really tough classes, great rigor, three, eight, three, nine, four, oh kids that just don't test well. And I could go on and on, Walter, about standardized testing. 
and, and my my viewpoint on it but i'll just i'll keep it at this when we went test optional it opened up the applicant pool for us tremendously tremendously where we were able to recruit a lot more kids from public schools a lot more kids from more diverse socioeconomic backgrounds um, so i'm a huge proponent of the of going test optional and i you know. do i i, I would i hope i wish they would make a decision and just get rid of it forever um you know and i get why they we require it you know because you're trying to look at it and compare this student to that student but i can tell you this we've been test optional for three or four years we've had our our highest team gpa ever team cum last year we were three four nine something like that and that's in an ivy league school right and so to me having a good test score is not indicative of you having success at Penn. It's just not. So to me, it's at this point, it's actually silly. I, I wish they, I really do wish they would get rid of it. And, and I, I forgot, I need to ask this question because parents ask me this all the time as it pertains to the Ivy League schools. Camp, when you have a camp, is it worth uh, an athlete that's a junior, sophomore, junior going into whether you have a winter camp, a fall camp, obviously you have summer camps, but those fall and winter camps, are they prospect only? Do you encourage people to have an interest in Penn uh, to attend your camps? Uh, how do you feel about the camp participation? Yeah, I think um, we, we run camps throughout the year. We actually do one in our, in our indoor facility in January, but we run a couple. Um, we run one in the fall, usually in October, third week of October. We run a couple in the summer. They're great for us. Camps serve multiple purposes. It, it, get, it allows you to see a guy face to face in person, interact with them for two days. You can find out a lot about them. Um, it also gives the student athlete a chance to spend time on campus to see if they think it's going to be a fit for them as well. So the, the camps are, are huge for us as far as how we go about uh, marketing our camps. You know, NCAA rules require that camps are open to everybody. Right. right? Um, now, are there kids when we're having discussions, you know, we'll mention, hey, you should you should think about coming to our camp if you're interested. We'd love to see you again and and have you on campus. So again, I think it from a, a couple different perspectives, uh, there are a lot of benefits about attending camps. With that being said, too, um, there's other things out there across the country where you can get your name out there. Some events, and I'm not going to get into name and names, right. but there's there's certain ones I think that I'm that I'm really um, that I really like attending. I think they're beneficial for us. Um, but you also, for parents, there's like, I get it. There's a cost involved. It's expensive. I don't think you need to go crazy either. Um, I think if you can kind of figure out what schools you're starting to gravitate towards, you know, picking and choosing a couple, I think that's a really good way to go about it. Well, I agree, uh, completely on your test optional, uh, topic. And I also feel very strongly that if you have a sincere interest in a, in a school, going to a camp is obviously going to offer you some added insight with regard to campus, geographical layout, uh, things of that nature, obviously develop a rapport with the staff. So I'm glad that you were able to share that with us. John, thank you a lot. I know this is a busy time of year for you. You have the admission stuff. It's holiday season coming up, end of fall season, et cetera. I want to say thank you. And parents, student athletes going to have all the information for, for Coach and Penn Baseball in the description, not only in the podcast, but as well as the video uh, on the YouTube. So you'll have the email address, the social media. You can find all that as well within the Baseball Blue Book, completely renovated app available in the Google and Apple uh, you know, app stores. And you'll be able to find all of the pertinent information pertaining to uh, Penn Baseball, the coaching staff, Twitter, social media, things of that nature. But, John, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks, Walter. Great.